All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another awesome Earth Rangers live session. My name is Catherine, and today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. But don't worry, because we are still going to meet some awesome animals. Now, before we get into that, however, I'm just going to tell you a couple things here. So we've actually met quite a few animal ambassadors so far on all the Facebook lives that we've had so far. And I'm hoping that everyone watching was able to meet them all. Now, like I said, this week we wanted to do something a little bit different. So here at Earth Rangers, of course, we are all about loving animals. But we are also all about loving the environment, of course. And um, now something going on in the environment that's been going on for quite some time is climate change. Now, when we think of climate change, we think of a lot of different things like heat waves, longer heat waves, or maybe some uh, sporadic weather patterns and just crazy temperatures all around, larger storms, all sorts of things. And we usually think of when we're thinking climate change, we usually only think about how these things are impacting us humans. But what about how they're impacting the animals? Now, climate change is having a big impact on animals all over the world, and you might not even know it. So today, we are going to meet some animals, and we are going to talk about how these animals, or how climate change, sorry, is impacting these animals in the wild and species similar to them as well. So we're going to bring out four different types of animals, and we're going to talk all about how climate change is affecting them. So we're going to start off with a reptile for our first animal that we're going to bring out. And of course, I want to point out, first of all, that thank you so much. We are generally uh, supported by Honda for this live before I get into that as well. So thank you, Honda. So as I was saying, our first animal ambassador that we would like to bring out for us is a reptile. And you guys might have already met her before. She has been on some of uh, quite a few lives now. But you know what? She just loves being on our lives so much that she asked us, asked us to come back again. And of course, we're going to let her do that. So without further ado, we have Earth Ranger Sadie and let's meet Shelly. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Earth Ranger Sadie, and I'm here with the lovely Shelly. Now, you probably recognize Shelly. She's probably been on more lives than any other animal ambassador we have here. She's pretty famous. Um, last week, we talked, we had her and Benjamin. We talked about the difference between turtles and tortoises. But again, Shelly's here for a bit of a different reason today. So um, I'll give you a little bit of background on Shelly before we get started in case you haven't watched some of our lives. So Shelly here is a Midland painted turtle. All right. And if you look close, she gets the name painted turtle because it looks like she was painted so beautifully with a paintbrush. That is how perfect her markings are. Now, you can actually find these turtles right here where we are in Ontario, as well as in parts of Quebec as well. So that's where they are found here in Canada. Now, Shelly, we think, is around 20-ish years old, but she can live up to 40 years or maybe even a little bit more. So she can live a pretty long time. Now, Shelly is a reptile. She is a turtle. And reptiles are kind of different from us mammals because they are ectothermic. Now that is a funny word, I know, but ectothermic basically means that Shelly cannot regulate her body temperature like you and I can. So when we get hot, we sweat. And when we get cold, we shiver. And that is how our bodies are trying to regulate our internal temperatures to get it kind of back to normal. Now, Shelly here can't do that. She has to use her surrounding environment temperature to to regulate her body temperature. So if she's kind of cold, they might sit in the sun and bask is what that is called, and they soak up all the sun's rays and warm up their bodies, get their bodies moving. Um, another thing that they do, um, they're not just ectothermic, and then if so, then, sorry, if she was too warm, then she might find some shade to cool down or jump into the marsh or the pond or the river that she might live in. All right, and that's how she would cool down. So reptiles are definitely different than us. Now, I don't know if you know this, but their eggs are almost kind of the same way. So when they have eggs, these eggs are actually going to use the sun to incubate them. So Shelly, if she was going to have a bunch of eggs or a clutch, she would dig a hole and bury them in there. Now, the eggs on top are going to get probably a lot more heat and sun than the eggs on the bottom. And so this heat is actually what makes females and males. So the warmer eggs, those are going to be females. But the cooler eggs that are kind of near the bottom and they don't get as much heat, those are going to be the males. 
males. And then the eggs in between are kind of going to be male and female. It's going to be a little bit different. So that's pretty cool, right? Everyone send a thumbs up if you think that is an awesome way for reptiles to have babies. So basically the warmer eggs on top, females, cooler eggs on the bottom are males. Now, if we want to think of this in terms of climate change, what kind of problems do you think reptiles could run into when it's really hot out. The temperatures are rising and it's always going to be a lot hotter. What do you think could happen to reptile eggs or like Shelly's turtle eggs? So leave your comments and we will read them out. I'll give you guys a few minutes to answer. All right. So that's all right. So basically, if climate change if it's too hot, Haley says, if it's too hot, are the eggs still able to develop? And exactly. So that's a good question to ask. And Bailey says, more of the babies would be female. Exactly. So you guys are all right. They would still develop normally, Haley, but like Lisa and Bailey have said, they will be more females. So you're going to have more females hatching than males. And that could be a problem, especially when it comes time to breed and maybe in the mating season when turtles are trying to have more babies. If they're all girls, that could be a potential problem. And that can happen for turtles like Shelly, but it can also happen for lots of reptiles as well. So that could cause problems in turtle populations, maybe a decline in eggs in the mating season. And that's definitely something that we don't want to happen, right? So that's kind of how um, climate change will affect reptiles and can affect reptiles and probably is um, as the temperatures are warming. But I think it is time that we meet our second animal ambassador. So Shelly is going to say goodbye to all of you. And we would, want, we would like to welcome out our friend Nacho and Catherine. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that, Sadie. That was so interesting, learning about how the temperature affects reptiles. That's really, really cool. Now, I have another awesome animal for you guys, and he is right here, right, and there, there he is in um, where you can see what his name is. His name is Nacho. Now, Nacho is basically a small, a toucanet, sorry. He is a type of toucanet, and a type, a Toucanet is essentially a small toucan. Now, specifically though, as you guys just saw it, Nacho is a curl crested arasari. Now, curl crest, he gets his name curl crested arasari. It's a really long name, but basically he gets his name because if you look on his head, you can see his beautiful beak there, but you can see right here on his head, he has small feathers that are kind of curly. They are basically curly on his head. Now that is why he gets his name. You can see their little black shiny feathers on his head there. That is how they get their name curl crested arasari. It basically means curly headed arasari. Now, these guys can be found in South America, more specifically, the southwestern Amazon basin. So countries like Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil is where you could find these guys. Now, these guys are very, very social animals. Nacho here is actually about three years old, but they could live to be about 20 years old, which is quite old for a little bird like this. So as I mentioned, he is a very social animal. Our saris are very social. They'll live in groups of five or more birds and they'll basically hang out together. They're gonna hang out up in the treetops. They like to live in tropical forests. So they'll hang out high, high up in the treetops and they're gonna be searching for food, but they're also gonna be interacting with one another as well. Our saris have a lot of different vocalizations. You might hear him say it, um, a couple hear him say a vocalization here or there, but right now he's kind of interested looking around the room. That is totally fine. But as I mentioned, they'll be hanging out on treetops. Now, if you could see, well, of course you could see him, but he is a very small bird. He's not a big bird compared to other birds that are out there. Our Asaris are small birds and they have small wings as well. So because of this, they actually aren't the great greatest flyers. So instead of flying around, they prefer to hop from branch to branch uh, to search for food and interact with another or just simply move around. They like hopping from branch to branch rather than flying because they live so high up in the trees. The trees kind of intertwine with each other in the forest, in the tropical forest. So it's really easy to just hop around from branch to branch, tree to tree to be able to get to where they need to go. However, if they have to fly, of course they will, but they prefer to hop rather than to fly. 
Now, if we are thinking of climate change, however, we're starting to see a lot more periods of drought. Now, drought is basically when it's really, really hot for a long time and there is no rain. Now, when this happens, something like a forest fire is can is a lot easier to come about. A forest fire can happen very easily easily because it's so dry out in the forests. Now, if a forest fire were to happen, it could cause something uh, called fragmentation of the forest. And that basically means that one big forest could now become patches of smaller forests. It could become multiple smaller forests rather than having one large forest. Now, this could affect birds like um, nacho and similar birds to nacho in the in uh, tropical forest because they will now have to travel longer distances to get to another patch of forest. If they if they are if there isn't enough food in that one patch that they are now, it might be harder to get to that other patch of forest because they can't hop anymore. They have to use their wings. They have to fly. But as a po um, unlike um, <clears throat> excuse me. Unlike hawks and eagles, where they use um, they'll use the high wind currents and they'll kind of soar up in the uh, up in the sky when they don't really have to use a lot of energy. These guys can't do that. They have to flap their wings, and they're what we call a short burst flyer. So basically, they could uh, they could fly very fast for a very short period of time, and then they have to land somewhere. They have to get their breath, catch their breath, breath basically, and then they'll be able to fly again. So it could be a lot harder for birds like Nacho to be able to find another patch of forest if there's a big, uh, basically, if there was a forest and now there's a big uh, blank patch between the other patch of forest for them to get to there. So that is how climate change can affect small birds like Nacho here. But um, all right, I think that Nacho did a good job for us. So now let's meet another animal and learn how this other, uh, how climate change is affecting this other animal. So we're gonna welcome back out Sadie and we're gonna meet the adorable Daisy. All right, everyone, this is Daisy. And Daisy is a striped skunk, as you can see. Now you're probably thinking, how am I so close to a stinky skunk? And that is because me and Daisy have a pretty good relationship. We hang out a lot, we're pretty good friends, and so that's why she's pretty comfortable just hanging out in my arms and munching on some treats for you guys. So Daisy's very happy to be here to tell you about how climate change can affect animals like her. So you can find striped skunks throughout Canada, the United States, and into northern Mexico as well. Well, they, you can find them in forests and grasslands mostly, but as a lot of you probably know, skunks have adapted very well to living in our cities and towns, stuff like that. So everyone send a thumbs up if you have ever seen a skunk in your neighborhood before, because I know that I definitely have one living in my backyard at this very moment. So even though that we find them in lots of places, they'll eat a lot of cool things too. They love things like mice, eggs, insects, berries, seeds, garbage, unfortunately, which is why we always want to make sure our garbage is wildlife safe, especially when they're living near us. But have you ever thought to yourself, um, where are the skunks in winter? Have you ever seen seen a skunk really in the winter? Probably not. And that is because skunks do something that a lot of other animals do as well, hibernate. And it's not true hibernation, she, but she enters a period of dormancy where she can go into a really, really deep sleep. And in that deep sleep, her whole metabolism will actually slow down, which is pretty awesome. So she doesn't really have to eat during this deep sleep. Now, skunks have to hibernate because they have kind of like skin on their feet, kind of like like us. If we were to walk around barefoot in the snow, it probably wouldn't feel too good. And that's kind of what Daisy has to hibernate as well. They do have these little tiny bodies, very, very tiny legs. So they're not the most agile in the snow. So right before, when it starts to get colder, what skunks do is they eat a lot of food because they want to get a good layer of fat for the winter. Now, once they eat enough, then they can enter this period of dormancy. So they'll go to sleep and their metabolism will slow down almost completely. And, they don't and they'll just live off of the fat stores that they have from eating in the fall right before winter. Now, when we think about climate change and how this affects hibernators, like maybe like Daisy is dormant, but bears hibernate, gophers hibernate, stuff like that. How can this affect them? Well, have you guys noticed lately in the winter, maybe even in the middle of January, there can be some pretty warm days and it melts all the snow. And then a week later, it is torrential snow. We've got blizzards. There's like ice everywhere. So it can change really quickly, right? And that's what climate change can do. It's this kind of a drastic 
Arctic temperature changes or changes earlier and then it gets cold again. So that can be bad for them because Daisy might wake up from her sleep thinking, oh, it must be spring, come out of her burrow and immediately she's gonna be hungry because when she wakes up, her metabolism wakes up. But then what if the next day it starts to snow again and Daisy can't find any food. So that is what can be bad for hibernators. If it makes them come out of hibernation too early or their period of dormancy, but then they can't find any food, that's probably not a good thing, right? And I mean, Daisy is dormant, so she can enter this period of sleep um, not as hard, but if we think about the implications this could have for larger mammals like bears and stuff that live here in Canada and other cold places where the temperatures can fluctuate a little bit in the winter, um, they could struggle a little bit, especially if they wake up too early. All right, and I see some people having some cute comments about Daisy. What a cutie pie. She's adorable, and honestly, she very much appreciates this. Daisy is the cutest little skunk. And I think she wants to introduce you guys to our last animal ambassador. They're pretty good friends. They've gone on a few tours together. So without further ado, we want to introduce back Catherine and Sonic. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Sadie. Um, that was really interesting. Love meeting Daisy. She is so, so adorable. But all right, now we have our last animal ambassador to explain to you climate change and the effects on these types of animals. So here I have the lovely Sonic. Now, Sonic is exactly as you guys could see it right here. He is a barn owl. Now, barn owls can actually be found on every single continent, except for Antarctica and, a certain, and certain islands. Now, there actually exists 35 different subspecies of barn owls found all across the world. And Sonic here is a European barn owl. So where do you guys think he lives? Where, where do you think we could find barn owls like Sonic if he's called a European barn owl? I'll give you guys a couple seconds to uh, write down in those comments, a European barn owl. Maybe he lives in Africa. Maybe he lives in Asia. No. All right. I think someone, I think some of them are answering. Yes, exactly. Easy peasy. He lives in Europe, a European barn owl, definitely found in Europe. <laughs> All right. So you could definitely found, uh, found, you could definitely find a uh, North, excuse me, you could definitely find barn owls like Sonic here in North America, but there are, they're a li little bit different. So as you can see, Son Sonic here is very light in coloration. He's kind of all white, has a little bit of gray on his back. Underneath his belly, he's nice and white. Now his North American cousins are gonna be a little bit different in coloration. They're gonna be a lot more brown on the wings and the back, as well as around Sonic's facial disc. Sonic, look this way, the camera's that way. There we go. He'll have br more brown around his facial disc as well. And speaking of facial discs, did you guys know that barn owls actually have the best hearing out of all the animals that have ever been tested? That's pretty incredible. And that is thanks to two things. So the first one is thanks to his facial disc. So his facial disc here, that basically circles his face once he's gonna be done looking around the room here. There you go, you can see it. This facial disc right here basically acts like a funnel and it helps to direct all of the sound into Sonic's ears so he could hear re really well. And then the second thing that gives him amazing hearing is of course his ears. Now the difference is that his ears aren't evenly placed on his head. One is actually higher than the other. And that actually allows Sonic to hear in 3D. It basically means that he's able to know exactly where a sound is coming from, how far away that sound is coming from, and if that sound is coming from the ground or up in the trees or anywhere in between. Now, barn owls are actually able to successfully catch a mouse in complete darkness, darkness, excuse me, complete darkness, simply by just using their ears, they are able to catch a mouse, which is actually pretty incredible. Now, barn owls like Sonic here don't really migrate. Now, barn owls might migrate within the country or within the continent that they live in, or reside in, sorry, but they'll, they'll rarely migrate to a whole other continent. Now, other animals, however, for example, the pink-footed goose, which is an animal that also lives in Europe. It winters in Europe, but it actually nests and breeds in uh, Greenland and Iceland. So they actually have to travel, uh, uh, they have to cross a whole ocean to be able to get to their destination. So, which is pretty, pretty Im impressive. 
Now, the reason why an animal will migrate is basically the same reason why an animal will hibernate. It's because there was no more food around for them or simply just because it gets way too cold for them and they don't want to deal with the cold, so they just leave. Now, if we think, however, like I said, of animals that are cr crossing the entire ocean, like the pink-footed goose, and we're thinking about climate change, we also know that we're seeing a lot more storms and we're seeing a lot more powerful storms at that. So imagine how hard it could be for an animal like the pink-footed goose who's flying across the North Atlantic and encounters a big storm. It's hard for them because they're in the middle of the ocean, so they can't really just find somewhere to sit down and or maybe they could sit on the water, but you might not want to when it's really, really, um, when there's a storm out. So they can't really go out to safety. They might have to either make have, have to do a detour, they might have to turn around, and it could also injure them. A big storm like that could also injure them without them knowing. So this is how climate change could affect migrating species as well. And another uh, animal, for example, that we could take is also the monarch butterfly or the monarch butterfly. Now this animal makes their journey from Canada every fall all the way down to Mexico, which is an incredible journey for such a little butterfly. But if we're thinking again, climate change, we're seeing a lot warmer weather. We're seeing warmer weather for a lot longer too. So that means that even in October and sometimes in November, you could get still warm enough weather for animals not to know that it's time to leave. So that means that the monarch butterflies are starting to leave a lot later on in, during the year, which could affect their, the areas that they have to stop to along the way because it could have started to get colder along the way. But it could also mean that a certain plant that was there that they needed to feed on during their migration is no longer there because that, air, that period for where that plant um, grows is done as well. So there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different uh, things that climate change is um, doing to affect different types of animals, right? So basically, at the end of the day, climate change is affecting every single, oh, nice wing stretched, <laughs> Sonic. So climate change is really affecting every single one of us and every single uh, species, animal species, insect on this planet. We just learned today how four completely different animals are being affected by climate change and a species similar to them, how climate change has an effect on them, which is really crazy. But here at Earth Rangers, we don't want to end this live on a, on a sad note. So we are going to tell you about ways that you can help. So I'm hoping that everybody listening today is already an Earth Ranger. However, if you are not, that is totally fine as well. It is completely free to become an Earth Ranger. And when you become an Earth Ranger, you are joining a movement of kids across Canada, thousands of kids across Canada, who are taking action to protect animals and the environment. Now, we give you access to real-world missions that help you realize the impact that we have on animals and, and, um, and the environment as well. And how you can be more conscious about um, being aware of how much uh, resources you're using and how you could maybe use less resources instead. There's tons of fun things on there. We also have our animal adoption program. And there you could directly protect one or all of the species that we're choosing to protect this year. Now, our animal adoptions also change every single year. And if you choose to protect Excuse me, Sonic, I'm talking. Now, if you choose to protect, um, where, sorry, the package that you choose, whether it's a virtually adopt an animal or to uh, do the plush package to adopt one of our animals, we are going to tell you exactly how that adoption is helping to protect the species that we are choosing to protect this year. So if you don't already have it, go ahead and download it on the Apple Store or Google Play and start your animal saving journey today. <laughs> but all right, everyone, I hope you guys enjoyed learning all about our cool animals today. All right, Sonic. And <laughs> don't forget to use our code Facebook Summer. Punch that in. You're going to get some cool points in the app for us, uh, for you guys as well. But we're ho hopefully we'll see you again next year. Next year, excuse me. What is wrong with me today? Next week. And we're going to have some awesome more animal facts for you today. But that about does it for today. Hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone.